Welcome to what I hope will prove a fruitful gathering for those wanting to take advantage of and support cultural opportunities in the Twin Cities, and those making strides toward making their art, science, theater, film, music, and literary experiences more accessible and known. I feel very short right now. My name is Courtney Gerber, and I know some of you, not all of you. I'm Assistant Director of Education here at the Walker, and fairly new but dedicated access advocate. The intention behind today's event is really to provide insight into how several cultural organizations in Minneapolis and St. Paul are actively working toward radical inclusion. This idea of creating environments and programs that take into consideration a public with diverse ways of experiencing the world. Successes and failures will be shared Feedback and a broader conversation will be encouraged. And although specific perspectives will be offered by our guest speakers, the hope is that during the Q&A, you all will contribute your own stories, questions, and feedback. So if there's something that you have been kind of working on in, in your mind that you would like to get some maybe hopefully clarification on today, don't be afraid to speak up and just share very openly. Um, I'm, I'm, this is going to be a very kind and generous environment. That's the tone I would like to set. Before I introduce our, part our participants today, I want to share an idea put forward by a woman named Nina Levant, who works for um, Art Beyond Sight, which is a collaborative organization in New York City uh, that emphasizes the visual arts as a vital part of the lives of people who are blind or have low vision. And the idea is this. Disability is a mainstream aspect of being human. It's not special or other, it simply is. It's as much a part of our daily existence as art, science, and language. So just kind of hold on to that idea as we, we progress through the morning. So now for the introductions. Our keynote speaker this morning is Leslie Orr. And Leslie is a playwright, performer, and a theater workshop instructor for voice, improvisation, and acting. She regularly performs and tours her original plays, Hand in Hand, Women Who Drink, and most recently, her storytelling piece, Wisecracks from My Father. Leslie was a company member and voice coach for the Minneapolis Children's Theater Company for 10 years, and was a company member with Ballet of the Dolls. She has also performed with Illusion Theater, the Jungle Theater, and Dudley Riggs. Leslie has received a Jerome Fellowship and a Jones Commission through the Playwright Center, a Playwriting Fellowship from the Minnesota State Arts Board, and an Achievement in the Arts Award from VSA Minnesota. Leslie is also the author and illustrator of a children's picture book, The People on the Corner, which she might be passing around later. Yes? Okay, good. Um, born legally blind, Leslie has for the past 30 years taught workshops nationally that uphold the possibilities of disabilities. She is married to theater artist Zararwar Mystery. Together, they own and operate Dreamland Arts, which many of you might be familiar with. Um, it's a performing arts studio and 40-seat theater attached to their home in St. Paul. So not literally in your home, attached, right? Yes, okay. So, I'm gonna stop talking and invite our keynote, Leslie Orr, to come and share some things with us. Leslie. Thank you. I thought winter was over. <laughs> so I'm so excited to be here. I really have wanted to be a keynote speaker when it comes to inclusion. I have my keynote costume on and everything. So I am as ready to go as I can be. And my husband said, well, what are you going to say for 45 minutes? And I said, well, I'm so glad they limited me because I could go on for the entire day. I uh, wanted to just let you know that inclusion is my passion as an artist. And I think that what, what brings me toward it is something that I want to explain to you first and why I'm involved, and you heard a little of my history and stuff. But I am going to just string a whole bunch of stories together that I think hopefully will 
culminate in being something inspiring for all of us because we're all so interested in improving all our situations so that more people can be involved. And then I will get on my thoughts and give them to you about access and you know accessibility cultural programs and the real reason that we are here. I talk a lot to kids and they, I'm the guest speaker and I'm told to come and I'm legally blind and they're so disappointed when I show up because I don't have a cane and a dog and the glasses. So I don't have all my props. And so then at least I can say, well, here's how I see. Cover your left eye, that's your blind eye. And then take your right hand and make a little telescope. That's called tunnel vision. And that's how I see right down the middle through my right eye, maybe about as far as my hand. So then they feel like they have a little something more adventurous out of me and they keep their hand up the entire time and spy on me. <laughs> and it does fool people because you never know about disabilities because you assume, well, this person just got up and they don't have anything that shows me visibly that they have a disability. And that's always a good thing to remember because you're not necessarily going to see it. And then someone like me with a telescope eye can look down on the floor and see one green pea and pick it up and the whole room then just yells, you fake, I knew you could see. I was, you know, so I, I come from a real hands-on past. I am one of eight children, fourth down, fifth up, and the three after me had cystic fibrosis. So my job was to take care of my three brothers who have all since passed away. I was 11 when the first two died 10 weeks apart at the ages of five and six. And then my last brother uh, died in 2005, and he was 47 years old, which was amazing. And he had a lung transplant 10 years before that. And they said, that's how long the lungs should give you your life, which was really wonderful. And John was an absolutely amazing person. So I got all my beginning imaginative game playing and ways to be around people with disabilities from them, because of course, the whole time you don't want to think you have one. So. They couldn't go outside that much, so we'd have beaches in the living room and all this fabulous stuff, which consequently brought the entire neighborhood over because we are doing the coolest stuff. <laughs> and uh, during that time, that's when I just started seeing, right from myself and from my brothers, what little problems disabilities actually are. It's the changes and the new things that come your way and the things that are unexpected, just like everything else, that tend to throw you off. Now, while I am talking, I also like to tell you that to keep people busy and from texting and going, getting on the phone, I like to have a show and tell so that you can have stuff to do while you have to listen to someone talk for a long time. So my, no, my neighbor, Dorothy Tucker, came with me, and we, she's going to just start passing around some of the stuff that I'm going to describe to you, such as my children's book and following that are some pictures that I have because in the back of the book I ask children to draw their first inclusive picture. So I've got some in the mail and they're very delightful, ones with words like autism, A-W-T-I-Z-U-M, uh, and things like that, uh, for you to look at. And I also have a little paper that I hand out of what I do and how you can find out ways to contact me to come to your school, just for your FYI. And then I have an odd picture from the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. It's of Ganymede, and I wanted you to see it because that's what I got to touch and most remember on my tactile tour while I was there. So important things do happen. So I grew up with my big family and my brothers in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and then came the time for me to come out into the world and be a performer after doing high school plays. And my children's theater um, high school instructor said, you should continue in children's theater and go to the children's theater in Minneapolis because they won't see how you can't move well. And that was totally the opposite. They had ballet, they had the hardest movement things I'd ever done in my life. And actually where I was the best is that they wear animal suits and you can't see in an animal suit. So it didn't matter, they could send me anywhere they wanted and I managed to stay on stage. Except one time I did do a split leap into the orchestra pit 16 feet down. So I lived. And um, you know, so it was, it, was so, it was actually something I had planned to do as a joke, sort of like the Warner Brothers cartoons where the coyote falls off the cliff. 
but they moved the crash pads that day and they put something else and so I went the wrong direction. But I still managed, I was so determined to make it funny, I still climbed up over the wall so you could have the painful looking coyotes, you know, <laughs> the whole bit. But um, it was quite an experience and I tried to acclimate myself with my disability to have it hidden so that it was, oh, look at that incredible woman. You'd hardly know she can't see. And then I got sent to Arkansas Children's Theater Company because they were doing the Miracle Worker and they wanted me to be the first legally blind person to play a legally blind person. And that was Ann Sullivan, who no one even knows that, in the Miracle Worker. So I went down there and I did the performance and I thought, great, I looked like I could see even for somebody who can't see. And they give the standing ovation at the end of the play because it's the miracle and everything. And this woman just stood up in the audience and she said, excuse me, really loud and the whole place got quiet. And she said, I just want you to know something. I am legally blind and I'm 35 years old and I've never done anything in my life. And seeing you do that has made a profound difference in my life and now I can believe in myself. So I thought, whoa, <laughs> that's intense responsibility. <laughs> and so then I headed back to Minneapolis determined to work for the Children's Theater again and do something about that because then everything came alive to me. I noticed I'm on a stage where no one else has a disability. I noticed that people aren't coming. Of course, this is the early 80s we're talking about. And it was interesting because there was talk across town about a thing called audio description and we're starting to get involved with interpreters and how about places for people to... So all of this little buzz was just starting to come alive and something to get involved in and it was very exciting. But then I thought, you know, I need a way to get up in front of people and talk about the possibilities of disabilities. And first I thought it was going to be like this. And then I thought there are too many people getting up and going into workplaces and talking to human resource organizations and things like that and telling people how they ought to behave at work with other people. So I thought, well, boring. I don't think that would be very good. How about if I continue what happened to Ann Sullivan and Helen Keller? Because that play is okay, but it lies to you because Helen learns wah-wah, she's great, spells some words, and they walk off into the sunset like everything is just going to be hunky-dory for the rest of her life which is not true because she just was beginning her struggles. At 12, she was sued for plagiarism, for writing a story like someone else's, which doesn't happen to most people who even aren't deafblind at the age of 12. And then she continued to go to Radcliffe and she learned four languages, written languages, and she went, decided she wanted to go out and speak about her life and herself and say all the optimistic things we know that Helen Keller did. But what she lost from her experience of plagiarism was being able to say or create something that was like her, that were from her thoughts. And we don't have that. We only have her biography and the history of her life. But she shied away from original works for fear she was unable to tell. So that's why she never ventured down that road again. And it's too bad because she was a socialist and she was very liberal and the opposite of Ann Sullivan actually, who thought that you didn't even need to vote. She thought, you, you don't need to vote to have a voice. So she was very different. And I, so I created this play called Hand in Hand that some of you may have experienced where you actually close your eyes and touch everything. And it's about what happened to Ann Sullivan and Helen Keller in their adult years and their lectures and the little of their history. And I did it so that people would come in and be very paranoid thinking they can't see and they can't hear because I don't allow them to talk. So they can't pass along an item and say, here's a flower. They have to find that person's hand and communicate. Well, within an hour, everybody's really good at communication. Not only are they really good, but when I start passing something at the beginning of the audience, the people at the ends, their heads go up like pointer dogs. They know something's coming. And so they have suddenly learned to become deafblind people in an hour. And they also learn that it's not bad. It's a change. Here's the adjustment you establish communication, and that you actually get a huge leap on establishing more innate awareness within yourself. And I asked questions during the play. Why do people think that what we have to enjoy couldn't possibly match what we could be missing? 
people constantly look at people with disabilities like, oh, you know, if they only had this. Well, everybody, you know, why don't even go there? All, just say that when it's too bad we all don't have a million dollars. That makes sense. <laughs> Everyone is unhappy until that happens. But <clears throat> truthfully, you don't know that and you don't to assume somebody is miserable is so hilarious if you think about it. Why would you, you don't even know that person. And because they may be sitting there looking totally spaced out or not at you, maybe depending on what you saw that made them think that they weren't in tune with the rest of the world, was just an assumption that you made but you know nothing about. And people have delightful times in their world to the point that people who are deaf do not want to gain their hearing back. They like their independence. I don't think if I was offered tomorrow 2020 vision, I think it would be terrifying because I'm used to my world and this is how I want it. And so that has been established. I don't even know what to expect because I was born, my mother had German measles, so I was born blind and actually lost the sight in my left eye when they operated on it. They used to needle cataracts. Now it's a 15 minute surgery that they just do in a hospital right away, you know, and I just never had very good vision in my eye that I wear my contact lens in to see 2400. So I just think I have it made, and you are all gorgeous, so you should be happy. No one has a blemish. It's the most beautiful, surrealistic place. It actually is fabulous for art because you can just come up with the sweep of things when you illustrate things. So for me, it works really well. And at the end, I just say to people that the darkness everywhere may hold more possibilities than even our greatest hopes. So that if you stand with a candle in the middle of the room and the edges are dark, what is yet or possible to co go over there is probably could be absolutely fabulous. We don't have to be born with this sense of doom all the time when it comes to the subject of disabilities. I think it's so funny because people used to want to say, if life gives you lemons, make lemonade. So now it says, if life gives you lemons, take the lemons. They're, you know, what's wrong with lemons? <laughs> there isn't anything wrong with them. Especially putting sugar in, you know, that, what's that going to do? So anyway, I, after this hand-in-hand -hand invention, I realized that the children's theater didn't have a tour. This was early on. Now they tour everything. And so I said, would you send me on a tour? And I'm going to go around in mainstream schools together in theater workshops. And I'm going to have people come to Hand in Hand, and some have disabilities and some don't, to create social situations, which is something we still must do to familiarize ourselves. Because you'd be shocked how many times I do finish the play and people open their eyes and I say, how many people do you know that have a disability or how many are your friends? And people don't know anyone. Maybe a kid will go, my grandma, she has a hearing aid, but it's still uh, unintentional segregation, you know, among us still happens, particularly in a small community, you know, that you just see it. So I went on this tour and I also said, I think it'd be really great if I taught these theater workshops with kids with disabilities, having absolutely no special education training. Nobody would allow me to do this now. I just walked in a room with all my determination deciding I knew what I was doing. And luckily for me it worked out because what I decided to do were create games where, to prove that everyone can play. I would say, all right, here, divide up in groups. Everybody make me a statue that you have seen on a vacation uh, or some monument like the Eiffel Tower or the Statue of Liberty. So you'd have a wheelchair and the kids would all get on top and they'd pile it up and put somebody up there with their arm up or the Statue of Liberty, you know, the Eiffel Tower the same way. And they would uh, make things like I'd say, I would like you to make something that moves and makes a sound. So I'm in this so-called special ed school in the middle of a cornfield in Nebraska. It's a house. For some reason, there are six women there who are their teachers. They're all pregnant, which was like sort of hilarious, you know. In a room full of people with behavioral disabilities and developmental disabilities of multiple kinds. I start the workshop, I do warm ups, I have everybody run around, freeze, run around, be this, be that. I say, run around, freeze, be a row of teeth. The kid in a wheelchair yells out, I'm the filling. 
uh, we, they all run around, run around, you know, okay, freeze, be chickens. And this one boy, which was my first glimpse of autism, said, I am not a chicken, I am a boy. And he had a striped shirt on and he ripped the sleeves off the shirt, you know. I said, fine, you can be a boy, you don't have to be a chicken, it's fine by me, you know. So it was just sort of, whoa, I see we're going into unknown territory here, but let's keep going. So then I say, all right, divide in groups, make me something that moves and makes a sound. So there are four boys with developmental disabilities, two with Down syndrome, and one girl who has brittle bone disease and she's in a long wheelchair with wheels in the front and it's a wooden platform so she really uh, has no movement in her body and so I came over and said what are you and they said a cuckoo clock so they open the doors and the girl comes out in cuckoos and they let her slide back and they had this gorgeous cuckoo clock and everyone in the room applauded and the girl burst into tears and she said oh thank you so much no one has ever clapped for me in my life so there was another, <laughs> I think I'm doing the right thing, you know. Um, and it was just one of those experiences like that that I never dreamed would happen. Then there was another incident in which I had uh, at the Aberdeen School for the Blind in South Dakota. And I said, all right, I'm going to name Freeze and become this and become this and become this. And they had one little boy, Sean, who would never cooperate. And he used a wheelchair, but he could get up. And they were trying to get him to get up to stand up against some bars and practice standing so that he could get up and sit down occasionally and get some muscular strength, but he'd never do it. And he'd been there like three years. So I said, all right, let's be kittens in a box. Suddenly I looked behind me and who was crawling toward me meowing on the floor, but Sean. We don't know, the teachers don't know, who knows why he wanted to be a cat in a box, but the power of arts, you know, a nice box, not that box, not the litter box, but the beautiful, <laughs> soft, cushy one with a pillow in it. Anyway, so, um, you know, I just kept experiencing little miracles like this, and then I saw that it was so extremely important to keep mainstreaming, mixing up, whatever you want to call it, providing ways for people to keep communicating their side of their ideas with my side of ideas, or crossing the so-called worlds of what's been put into play in theater and art and what someone can bring to it. And you still run into these situations. Even a year ago, I went to a center and they said, I have this thing called the Stuffed Animal Show. So I bring the stuffed animals, or you bring your own, and I'll give you one if you don't have one, and we are going to create a play with them because kids become attached to stuffed animals and they'll speak through them more than puppets. So they said, you're probably, they're probably going to listen to you for about five minutes. They don't have a long attention span. One hour later, we're still doing the show. So it just lets you know that's what happens. People, once they get involved and once they feel that they can be included, they will thrive. Another thing that happened on that tour was I met all these kids from Hawaii, Alaska, I did every state. I met every kid every type of kid. And uh, I decided I would take all the children that I met, my favorite ones, and create a book called The People on the Corner. And I started drawing it in 1984, and it took me 18 years, and I opened, and I let the book be shown at the Walker for the free first Saturday. And, it was, and uh, I actually had, uh, in the Walker, they have a room where kids can do some drawing, and then they see an event, and then they participate in some other activities. So I had some black and white drawings from the book that they got to color in. And one of the exciting pictures is a tree fort. And it shows that every, there are elevators to the top and the wheelchairs can go in there. And it's the one page that all the kids stop dead on to look at. And I did it so that I figured if you're a tiny child and you're three years old and you open a book, if you don't see a reflection of all types of people, how can you accept all types of people? because they will be foreign to you. And so I started the drawings, and I say 1984 because when you look at the book, how you'll know is there's a page where the kids are on the phone talking to each other, and the phones have cords. <laughs> so, you know, I and just sort of wanted to keep that sort of acronym in there of 
it looks like it's in the 50s, it looks like now, it looks like, you know, the way you see it, it's rather a cartoon thing out of the New Yorker sort of thing, but it just gives kids an idea that not only are there ways to include people in pictures, there's ways to include people in your neighborhood. The point of the book really is everybody gets included, not because the kids have disabilities, but because the neighbors that move in, in the story, are good neighbors, and they just don't care whether it's block parades or neighborhood plays, everyone's included. So I'm hoping in my life this is the most inspiring thing I can leave on the planet because it's always going to be there for a young person to get their first introduction to different types of people. And so sometimes I, I teach, I've taught for the past 15 years at the Young Authors Conference, and a lot of times I have kids do an exercise where they are going to write a paper about their friend with a disability. And then I'll say, would you like to share what you wrote? And they always get up with the saddest look on their face. My friend Sarah has a disability. She can't see. She hates it because she thinks people will be mean. She never has anyone at her house. You know, it's just like I'm ready to cry right there, you know, like, why do you think that? You know, why do you just assume? But they want to go for the saddest thing in their life that they can think of rather than, then I say, okay, Instead of the person with a disability, now I want you to tell a story and draw a picture of your favorite alien friend. They jump out of their chairs. They head to the blackboard. They draw six heads, five stomachs. I say, what does that alien do? They drink Coke out of this elbow and they burp out the other one. And they just tell me, they go on and on. And he's weird. And he goes, ding, 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 and then they do his voice. And they everything, and I say, well, then why don't you talk about your friend with a disability like that? You know, that's, that's what it is. So some kids said, I didn't know disabilities could be fun. I said, well, sure, of course. You know, why do you, I, when you look at a wheelchair, I know you want to get in one. You know you want to zoom down the street. Don't tell me you don't want to do that. You know, so it's, it's, the, it's what people have been told to avoid or do things. But actually, the truth is, we are all our own kind of aliens. I have a keychain that says just visiting this planet because... It, I, sometimes I think I am from wherever I came from. And I think we all like to feel that way. And then we want to cater to each other's needs for the services that we want to provide for them in whatever arts organization we have. And we have to end the whole thing where uh, E.T. goes home, or it's so painful the hunchback goes up the hill and all of those things. We like that, but that's an old story and it doesn't happen anymore and nobody, nobody wants it, especially especially if you talk to anyone with a disability. It's, it's something we're proud of. We like who we are. So I decided to keep the image of people in society and visibility very strong. So I thought, I can't just do hand in hand. Otherwise, the, the blind lady doing the blind play, and then I just get like Helen Keller, and I'm only about that. So I wrote a show called Women Who Drink. And so I do 16 characters named after their drinks, and I decided that two of them, Shirley Temple and Coke, have disabilities. One um, has Down syndrome, and she just says, uh, where her, she wants to move into an apartment, and she says, what does her mother think? People with too many chromosomes don't have a social life. And then there's another person that I kneel behind the bar as a little person, because, and that's not her problem. Her problem is she doesn't want to be drunk anymore. And so she goes on about you know, her new life and sobering up and things like that. And she does loon calls. And actually, I did this play last week in a freezing place like this. <laughs> and it was so cold, I got to the loon, and the loon is supposed to go, ooh, ooh, like that with a real high pitch, and I couldn't do it. And it was in a winery, so I go, ooh, like this, and the whole room of women go, ooh. <laughs> thought, well, it works, so, so much for that, and worrying about what works and what doesn't. But I, I did this show, and I did Hand in Hand, and I've been doing those two shows for th almost 30 years. I started when I was five. Anyway, <clears throat> but I, um, I do them, and I used to think that people who do the same thing are like those people at Chan Hass, and I thought, how sick, how can anybody do I do I do for umpteen years? And here I am, I'm doing the same play 30 years later. But... Uh, I'm so glad to be able to do it. I never realized, are you kidding? You're not fired from your job. How lucky can you get? 
But I started adding more things for different reasons with the use of disability. One, when I added my wisecracks from my father, it was because he was starting to get dementia. I wanted his stories from the war, and I wanted what he did in his life. And what was interesting was, as he told the stories and felt empowered, he got better. And so it's an incredibly healing experience for people to be able to be involved in the arts and express themselves. And right now I'm with my neighbor Dorothy here at Lingblomston and we're teaching theater classes. And everybody wakes up, the, you know, and just loves being vital and alive. And you see the circulation going through their hands and their faces and they're smiling. And it just seems to be more and more important that we keep trying to touch into the various different worlds and lifestyles of people who do not get to get out as much or seem to be cut off from, uh, you know, a lot of social public situations. I um, also do, as I mentioned, the stuffed animal show, and I have this little character called Tex, and he's in a wheelchair. And you get these wheelchairs from Lakeshore Learning, they're for preschools to have so that kids see equipment when they're young and they start playing with them. And it's very important because I want them to see a typical show with stuffed animals in it and one of them has a disability just because one of them has a disability. It's part of the picture. I also uh, decided, you know, later on that I finally married, had a family. My child Sam is 13 and was born on Helen Keller's birthday, so I thought that was a special gift to me, and I'm very thrilled. And then I started, because I had a child, then I, I started to work at Interact. I thought, great, I'll work with a population of people, and then I'll have my child in daycare. And it was sort of like, well, I have a ton of people here, and there's a ton of kids there. It really wasn't different enough. <laughs> so, and my child was not thrilled with the daycare, so I had to leave, and I got a great exposure into the world of finally seeing performers who were on stage, who had disabilities, and it, was, it just felt so great to feel at home with other people that were so like-minded. And uh, after I got back home, then I felt obligated to help take care of all my friends who had children who had to work. So I started Camp Fun and Camp Bravo and Camp whatever, but I also wanted to make sure I was very inclusive. We would come to the old walker a lot, it was a great way to climb eight stairs with kids and then make them climb back down because they'd be exhausted and fall asleep. It worked really well. <laughs> so uh, when we started Camp Bravo, I had um, a young man, Sam Graves, who's now graduating and going to college, and he was in every show, and he used a wheelchair, and he had cerebral palsy, and Sam had been with me for so many years that I got this sort of... Uh, little junior high girl with attitude, lot, very rolly eyes, you know, when you'd say a lot of stuff. But she came in and she sort of sat off by herself. And I turned to Sam and I said, now, Ariana's new in our class. I want you to include her in all the things that we do. And the look on his face, because I wasn't saying that about him, I didn't go to her and say, you should include Sam in what we're doing. He was the old timer, so he was the one that had to make her more welcome. But just the fact that he got to feel empowered and have the role play of the one who'd been there before and not the one who was being different and special was a huge thing. And I didn't even really think about it, you know. So it was such an important thing, and I was thrilled that I got to do that. And I am continuing to try to write more work. I am now in the process. My next thing's going to be, since I do have some vision like Mr. Magoo, my next show will be called What I Thought I Saw, <laughs> Random Acts of Blindness. So I'm hopefully going to, and I want to have no props or scenery. I'm so tired of lugging stuff around. So I hope it'll just be highly imaginative. When I wanted to be inclusive in the community, I decided when I moved and we bought our first home that I should join the Kingfield Neighborhood Board and get involved in seeing what's going on. It was a great way to discover other things outside of the arts, like transportation access, things like that. And then I joined the Minneapolis Council on People with Disabilities, which is responsible for the um, access, transportation, and employment situations for people in Minneapolis. And when I moved to St. Paul, I had to quit. I was crushed. But we got to ride the train early. We got to make sure the doors open. Those little dots along there are called truncated domes. They made them wrong. We had to have them take off, put them, you know. So I learned all this really cool stuff that was totally out of my field so I could sound really smart. 
and I got to go to the architects' convention and try to talk people into making buildings and homes with what they call visitability, meaning we can't just change form over function very much, but please, could we have one door that might let everybody in? Could there maybe be a wider bathroom door? Things like that to make our future possible for letting more people participate in things. And we had some fascinating things that I never expected. One of the first things that we had was there were cab drivers, maybe some remember that, they had sort of a spiritual awareness of the dog that was not something that was very friendly and in some religions an evil character. So people who were blind who used service dogs would wait and the cab would pull up, get terrified of the person with the dog and leave. Well, of course, they're leaving someone who's blind who doesn't know they took off. So we had to sit everybody down and go, look, if you don't want to take the call, just say you don't want to take the call, we'll send someone else, but please verbally tell the person that someone is coming to get you, you know. Then we would sit there and have arguments with people from like airport shuttle on that they have to have a van that picks up a person who uses a wheelchair who's going on a business trip available. And what's so funny is they keep going, well, we don't know if we can get enough calls and they're having these arguments with you in a room with 15 people who are business people who use wheelchairs and you think, how can you keep arguing with me? We're telling you we need this and if it's there, we'll use it. So you just, you just come up with all kinds of different things that you never imagine might be in your path and you try to tackle it together. And so it was a fascinating fascinating board to be on and they're still there and they meet every third Wednesday of the month so if you ever have something that you feel it could be of use to you or you want to get some more attention out there about what you're doing contact them they're very great my husband and I drifted um, in the theater world he actually was at the Walker for a while and Guthrie and Children's Theater and so was I and we sort of broke down and decided we wanted smaller community theater input so that we could really get people excited about building healthy community experiences on diverse and levels and using more people with disabilities that are talented in the community. So we started this theater in a high school called El Colegio at the time on 42nd and Bloomington in their theater. It was called CIA. We thought it was so cool, you know, having a theater called that, you know, so Center for Independent Artists just before 9-11. <laughs> Not only did no one come, but we had the wrong name. So, but we continued on and tried to do it until it was in a high school and there's just too many gum on the chair situations. So we thought, you know, maybe sharing isn't the best idea here. So we, we our daughter's school closed, Cooper. And so we decided, well, you know what? We should, uh, th when a school closes, that's when you move. So we looked online and suddenly saw an electrical contractor shop that had a uh, basement through the laundry room that connected to our house. So I actually can go down, do the laundry, go down more steps and then be in the basement of the theater and go up. Well then we had to rebuild it and do the construction and we got some assistance and we made a stage in a 40 seat theater. And I love it because I like to go, oh my God, I left my costume at home and run over across <laughs> this, it's very fun. And I can't drive. So it's actually been an absolutely fabulous place for us to be and it allows us to have a place that we can build a healthy community through the arts on a small scale. And it's open to everyone and we ask people if you have something, it's great for one person things, it's great for music, but we do have to curate things we did find because we were excited and we had one person approach us that had a disability and they read us their script and it was full of racial slurs so we had to go, well, maybe you ought to work on that a while, you know. <laughs> But you do kind of find that. Sometimes you find older people and they want to tell jokes. My dad has a few, you know, that are just sort of not fitting of the modern times. And so uh, that, that happens so that I'm not just saying that everybody just should be welcome. Of course, we're talking disabilities and of course they have to be um, exercised, especially when people have uncontrollable audible sounds that might be made in the middle of an orchestra. You know, we have to have considerations as to when and how that happens, what room everyone can be in, and how we can best benefit both people involved. And I am sure everyone wants to be somewhat like us and have access for the arts for their events. And sometimes there's no explanation why people come and why they don't. 
we sit there all the time. There'd be two people in the audience and the artist will go, well, it's a nice day. Who'd come inside on a nice day? That's it. I know, it's the construction on university. That's why they're not there. Well, see, there's a lot of people here today, so you go, okay, Friday works well. We'll have more events at 10. The 13th is a good day. So, you know, you start keeping track. Let's get see, let's see where everybody came from, how they got here. And you think it's gonna work, and the next time, there no, no one's there and who knows why. But there are some things that I think we all know that we want to do. And that is that, um, you know, like we, that there are things that have to be in place. Sometimes you put something out there. I had this happen. I invented the stuffed animal show and I thought every five-year-old would be there because they can make them talk and they're imaginative. No one comes who's five. They're three. The five-year-olds are in ballet and in classes. It's the parents with the toddlers that are climbing the walls, and that's who comes. So you think, oh, okay, I have to move this down a scale so that they can understand what's going on. But that'll happen to you. Um, I think that familiarity is our biggest word that we want to put out there because if someone can be familiar with something, people's situations, where they are, memorize it. I was shocked. I just took... 31 eighth graders to Spain for their school trip, and I had to hold someone's arm the whole time because I have these two cities memorized like the back of my hand, and I never realized how much I really didn't know. And even in the museums, you know, I, I was surprised, you know, that that's not my, what I know, and the questions that I had and the things where steps were and not, it was pretty shocking to find out. A lot of things are just basic, cons you know, human considerations that we want to have. Prearranged transportation is huge. If you can get a group of people together and say, meet in front of this building and a big van will pick you up or two vans, you are in, you know, if you can supply cab rides, if you can whatever, that's probably our, the trains, the more, more public transportation we get, we're going to see more people because it allows you to be independent and get somewhere. It allows me to do that, and I feel less fear all the time. So, unfortunately, we're, no matter what setup we have, the Twin Stadium and the Mall of America keep winning because they're just built for function on a high level. And so if people can get in there. And then when people go in, they like having the ownership of knowing what the activity is. Baseball, we, they, you know, we've heard about it from the beginning, and now the more we can get into people's lives and give them education about theater. This is huge. It, it will give us the win-win situation also. Personal programs are so great. With the Institute of Arts, that, that tactile tour with Ganymede and wearing the gloves, I sobbed being able to touch the soul of the artist. It was shocking. So I think if you get some dark glasses as a cane, go over there and tell them you need a tactile tour because <laughs> if it's just... Absolutely, and it should be something you should get to do whether you see or not, sometime in your life, because you do just go, this person touched this, and I did too. And it's, it's just absolutely lovely. In studying things and having more familiarity, one time um, when my child was in, um, Sam was in Longfellow School, and we wanted to go to the Guthrie, the see Midsummer Night's Dream with the big egg. And we were all so excited. And they weren't going to let us go because it wasn't part of success for all or whatever it's called or no child left behind and all that. And we just thought, forget it. We got everything to do with Midsummer, even comic books. We studied it for a year. They got to the play. The actors were there after. They were going home on the bus not saying, I like the play. They were like, she was a good Helena. I really liked her. You know, they were total critics. They, they're still talking about it. Three years later. They have their programs. It has, you know, there were people learning English as a second language, people who had disabilities. And because we worked on it and stayed on it and got them to that day in the dream going to the theater, it was amazing. And we do that at Park Square. I teach there in the immersion program. And we've had people start out at Harding High School, one foot out of jail. There's one girl. She is going to go to Gustavus, major in theater, just directed her first Shakespeare play, and it's because they get beyond just showing up on the bus, an experience that gives them a little ownership on what's about to happen. It's huge. We do, I have four minutes, so I'm gonna talk really fast because I think it's important. 
But we do have to improve signage, huge. I think what I recommend is that uh, you go around, you get in a wheelchair, ride around your place. You um, take off your glasses or wear fuzzy ones and try to read a sign. Then put signs up on the wall that you can take off so people can hold them and put them back, you know, rather than making it tiny so you don't ruin the art and the painting. Keep it tiny, but people just want to go like this, especially when you're older and you have your cheaters. It, it just needs to get closer to you. Find out what aisles you can't go in or how it is from your parking lot and things like that. And bring some expert with you who already does use a wheelchair or does have low vision or is blind to help you. But put yourself in their shoes as much as you can. Ask for ideas. Listen to the complaints of people who are not chronic whiners. They probably have something to say. Okay? You know, I get that there are those people. Even at, you know, Lingblomston, there's one lady who, I have a micro Madonna microphone on my head and she's still going, I'm wearing two hearing aids and I still can't hear. You know, so... You know, you, you try to say, I'll talk louder, I'll do my best, and you can only do your best. So we're, we're trying. We are all trying. Um, and when you make the signs, they are for the least sighted, not for the best sighted. Okay? So that, and people do ask questions. If they walk up to you and say, where's the bathroom? And you go, that sign over there says, well, if they saw the sign over there, they wouldn't have asked you where the bathroom was. So that doesn't happen so much for us in arts organizations. But yes, at Target, it does and places that are, have 15 year olds who wanna, you know, I got my job, I have to tell that lady. So, you know, <laughs> you will meet that person, but I'm just saying, it does help to try to keep a kind face under the worst of circumstances. Um, there are um, a lot of people that you'll get different types of disabilities. You, you, I told you, please assume that you can't always tell and another thing to know now, too, is that in the expectations of theater and disability, we're changing. We don't want to just see the typical musical, or, you know, especially like at Interact. You're seeing a performance where people are doing it from the way they are. If you see deaf poetry, it's going to be presented the way they want to do it. And people are, are now walking around with pride presenting from their way of doing it, which is the way it should be. It's the way that if the alien came, yes, we'd be going, how do you sing? How do you stand? How do you do this? Not, how can you imitate me doing that? It's very important. I have to say I was so disappointed in the film Avatar. And I think it's because the man uh, was in a war or something and then he got his wheelchair to use. Had he been born, I don't think that it could have been tolerated. But when he woke up in his dream, he should have still been in the wheelchair and zipped around. That would have been three times as exciting to see him have fire on the back of that chair, zipping through the jungles, being this cool dude in blue, going around his planet in a dream state, using his chair rather than thinking, oh good, I have to get out of it. It would have worked, it would have flown, it would have done what everybody wants with wheelchair. Flying chairs, higher heights, you know, they just need a few adjustments. Now, <laughs> People will go where they can see a reflection of themselves. And this is a problem because we do have, if you go online, you can see it's our story. And they do tell you about the history of disabilities, and it's great. And it was all started for the celebration of the ADA's 20th year anniversary. And it's a wonderful website, and you can find out all this information. But you can't expect a lot of people to tend to come into some areas of a museum or something if it's constantly not them. And same with why I made the children's book. We have to just keep putting more information in or bringing out, yes, this person, that statue is of a blind person. The person in that painting is, you know, so that people do realize they were there and they are going to be there. Because what we found out is that if a student goes into a schoolroom and they don't see a reflection of themselves somehow in a picture of what they're reading, they'll look out the window and they'll never come back. And they can't feel that they belong. So we know that we want to support people, and you're all, of course, all our efforts are toward this, but it's something that we need to remember. From today, what I hope to, we continue is that this discussion keeps going on annually, and that we update our findings and keep evolving with all the trends that happen to us, because just as soon as we get some equipment in that's going to help somebody maybe who can't see or is low vision like myself, somebody's going to come up with a GPS. And it's in the walls and it tells you, you know, it's just going to keep changing. So we're, we're not just going to be able to settle it all today, but we're going to keep moving forward. And um, 
I think what we all know is that we just want to all be equally valued. And someone brought up earlier that everything, it's not a problem, it just is. And so how do we accommodate and each circumstance that comes our way? And my hope is that as all of us as ambassadors of inclusion, that we will feel excited, not obligated, to support greater accessible cultural programming. And that we believe it will benefit the splendor of our imperfect world. Thank you. Thank you.